it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tales from the Iron Triangle, War Paints. Operation Junction City, February 1967, Republic of South Vietnam. Sergeant First Class Martin Brubaker hadn't slept a wink since brutal Viet Cong ambush which devastated his platoon the day before. How could he? His soldiers were sky troopers, part of the Army's elite 173rd Airborne Brigade. But yesterday, Mr. Victor treated his paratroopers like they were VC's bitches. His young paratroopers were shaken. They'd been in Vietnam for two months and, as yet, had not suffered a single casualty. Then, in less than an hour, his platoon of paratroopers got chewed up and spat out like a wad of bubblegum by an enemy that proved to be highly motivated and highly dedicated and could survive for days on rice and fish sauce. Sergeant First Class Brubaker knew that he probably looked like a crumpled up shitbag as he was summoned to the First Sergeant's tent that morning. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. He spent the entire night trying to console his young Sky Soldiers while wrestling with the fact that, for the first time in his six year army career, he didn't have all the answers. First Sergeant Gordon, Gordy Malone, was a six foot three inch Sky Soldier a by-the-book senior NCO who took no shit from anyone, regardless of their rank or race. By sheer force of testosterone-fueled intimidation, Malone commanded the respect of everyone in his company, whether they were a white Confederate flag-waving redneck or an Afro-wearing black liberation activist. Malone was black himself, and in his Bravo company, you conducted yourself as a goddamn sky soldier and the most elite, professional, deadly mother humper in the goddamn valley of death. If not, Malone would personally make your life a living tragedy. There was no one in between with Malone. The 173rd had a motto, kill professionally. And that's what the Sky Soldiers excelled at. Bravo Company didn't suffer from any of the racial strife and indiscipline that plagued some of the freaking leg units lowly, non-parachute-qualified ground-pounders who offended the gods of war by simply breathing. The 173rd Airborne wasn't like the infamous 23rd Infantry American Division, the American Division that seemed to be made up of white trailer trash and black ghetto thugs that had been hopelessly thrown together and told by their political masters. Here, you fight this war. First Sergeant Malone kept his company at the pinnacle of military discipline and teamwork, his soldiers more afraid to incur the big first sergeant's wrath than they were to cater into their personal racial biases and bigotry. But yesterday was different. The freaking commies hit the entire battalion hard, and Malone's first platoon of Bravo Company took it right on the chin. First Sergeant Malone didn't say anything as Sergeant First Class Brubaker, Bravo Company's first platoon sergeant, didn't bother to come to parade rest as he entered the tent and simply plopped himself down on the aluminum seat in front of the first sergeant's desk. Jeez, Martin, you look like shit, said Malone, offering Brubaker a pal mal. Brubaker accepted the cigarette gratefully and lit it with his zippo. I look better than I feel, Tom, said Brubaker. Any word? Malone studied his first platoon sergeant. Brubaker was easily his most experienced and trusted platoon sergeant as one of, and was one of the very few soldiers in the company who was as tall as he was. Both tactically and technically proficient in all of his combat skills and totally fearless in combat, Brubaker was one of those iconic Sergeant Rock types that soldiers naturally followed into battle. In fact, in less than a year, Brubaker was going to pin on his E8 rank and become a first sergeant himself. But today, today Brubaker was a wreck. Malone didn't have the time to mince words. Wilson, Peterson, Fenton, and Halua are at the Tan Thon Nut Airbase, started Malone. They'll be on the Freedom Bird back home by this evening at the latest. Well, with any luck, they'll be back in the States by the end of the week where their families can claim their bodies. Brubaker nodded as he looked down at his muddy jungle boots, remembering when the ambush had started. Private First Class Peterson and Private First Class Fenton were all FNGs, effing new guys, still fresh from the jump school and weren't even in country long enough to catch VD from a bar girl in Saigon. 
The novice soldiers were still brand new and gung-ho, smelling like cheap old spice and betting on who would get the first kill as they were walking across a rice paddy when the enemy set off a well-hidden, command-detonated mine in a rice paddy dike which blew them all to pieces. Their squad leader, Sergeant Halua, the brawny, foul-mouthed, hard-charging Pacific Islander from Hawaii, had warned them about getting complacent. He ran forwards across the rice paddy to get his fallen men, yelling for the medic. Suddenly, a machine gun hidden in a bunker camouflaged to look like an embankment opened up on him at close range. Big Sergeant Halua was literally cut in half while the medic, Specialist McPherson, took a round in the small of his back before he could even take three steps. In less than five seconds, it was effing communist son of a bitch's fall. The United States of America, zero. The rest of the platoon divided to one side of the raised dike on which they were walking and ducked into the brown waters of the rice paddy. That's when the entire world erupted with automatic weapons fire in a textbook enemy ambush that caught the American platoon out in the middle of that damned rice paddy. Lieutenant Don Levy and Specialist Gonzalez are also at Tan Son Nut, awaiting evacuation to Japan, continued First Sergeant Malone. Lieutenant Don Levy had his right arm amputated and Gonzalez has lost sight in both of his eyes. As first Sergeant Malone spoke, Brubaker was having flashbacks of the day before. Everything happened so quickly, and it seemed as if they were moving slowly, as if in a dream. When the ambush occurred, Lieutenant Dunleavy and his radio man, Specialist Gonzalez, had jumped down off the paddy and took cover behind the embankment in the fetid-smelling, knee-high brown water. The fire coming from the enemy positions was so intense that almost none of the American paratroopers could return fire. Lieutenant Dunleavy got on the radio to TOC, Tactical Operations Center, to request air or artillery support when two well-placed enemy RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, impacted right where the platoon leader and his radio man had taken cover. Both of their bodies were blown into the air and they landed in a smoking, bloody heap. As a platoon sergeant, it was Brubaker's job to mentor and advise the young new incoming lieutenant so that he could effectively lead his platoon during combat. Don Levy was just a kid in his early twenties, barely even older than his radio man, but he was turning out to be a fine leader. Well, that one really hurt Brubaker, although there was nothing really he could have done to prevent it. Lieutenant Don Levy did everything right, said Brubaker. He took cover with his radio man and quickly called for supporting fires. But, well, what did that get him? Dunleavy is laid up in some field hospital with a stump where his arm should have been. He's probably going to get a bedside Purple Heart award from some desk riding office jockey general who couldn't give less than two shits about young Lieutenant Dunleavy. The specialist Gonzalez is the platoon's artist. He wanted to use his GI Bill to become a painter once he completed his tour of duty. How the hell is he going to do that now? Brubaker's voice creaked as he gritted his teeth. You saved your medic's life, Martin, said First Sergeant Malone. You got McPherson aboard the dust off before he bled out. He said he couldn't feel his legs, Tom, said Brubaker. I saved him only so he can live out his life as a paraplegic. He's alive, Sergeant, said Malone. You got him out. You got your lieutenant and your radio man out, and you got the rest of your platoon back into the tree line while the freaking red legs put high explosive steel on the rice paddy. And second platoon went in to secure the area after we hit the enemy positions with artillery, and a pair of Air Force F-100 Super Savers hit Mr. Victor with nape. Oh, and second platoon went in to secure the area after we hit the enemy positions with artillery, and a pair of Air Force F-100 Super Savers hit Mr. Victor with nape. Second platoon found nothing. Ah, the second platoon sergeant said that Mr. Victor escaped down those damn tunnels that the frickin' VC dug underneath all of the Iron Triangle, said Brubaker, almost shouting. Junction City was supposed to be a multi-divisional operation with us. The 1st Infantry Division and the 25th Infantry Division. The best of America's best divisions were supposed to strike into the heart of the frickin' Iron Triangle with all of our might and shit down the throats of Ho Chi Minh's boys. Instead, all we did was poke a stick at a hornet's nest, and they all swarmed out on us. Brubaker exhaled, realizing that he'd almost raised his voice to his first sergeant. Malone was staring coldly at him, 
and Brubaker knew he was close to crossing a thin line. While the first sergeant was being somewhat lenient with him, Brubaker knew Malone would not tolerate any insubordination from one of his platoon sergeants, whether Brubaker had just survived an ambush or not. Brubaker exhaled again. I'm, I'm sorry, Top, said Brubaker. I didn't mean to sound like I was throwing in the towel. Hey, I almost lost my entire company at Poussin, Sergeant Brubaker, said Malone sternly. That's over 70 men killed in less than an hour. In Korea, we would have prayed for a day like you had yesterday. We never threw in the towel. When the Chinese came pouring over the ridge, we fixed bayonets. Brubaker nodded, suddenly feeling ashamed. Malone was only 17 when he'd volunteered to join the army and fought against the communists in Korea back in 1952. Malone was part of the army 1st Cavalry Division back then, and had somehow survived the retreat from Busan. Brubaker's platoon suffered four men killed in action, and three men wounded in action yesterday in a stinking Vietnamese rice paddy. In Korea, the Americans had lost several platoons every day. Brubaker changed the subject. Any word on Private First Class Neely? he asked, putting out his cigarette. Not yet, said the First Sergeant. Private First Class Neely was one of the other FNGs and was a fourth member of Sergeant Halua's rifle squad. He'd somehow gotten separated from the rest of the platoon when his squad was annihilated and was not present when the order was given to pull back. Second platoon later found his jammed M16 rifle in the water, caked in mud after the Air Force plastered the rice paddy with napalm but there was no sign of Neely. There was a Marine recon team in the area, continued First Sergeant Malone. They searched for him last night, but the area was crawling with NVA and VC. Oh, the Marines got caught in a firefight and suffered KIAs. They had to extract under fire. Has Neely been listed as MIA? asked Brubaker. For now, answered Malone, but we will find him. First Sergeant Malone leaned forwards and offered Brubaker another cigarette, which Brubaker politely refused. Martin, said the First Sergeant, you're the best platoon sergeant I have in the company. There are 27 soldiers in your platoon that just got their asses handed to them, and they're all shaken up right now. I need to know if you can lead them. Really, Top? said Brubaker, determination now coming back to his voice. That was never an issue for me. Frickin' Victor Charles owes us a shit ton of payback, and first platoon is gonna collect. Good, said Malone. Because last night, Air Force F-4 Phantoms and F-100 Super Sabres hit three entire grid squares with Snake and Nate. Later today, they're going to arc light the hell out of the place with B-52s. Tomorrow, battalions pushing back into the Iron Triangle from the west while the 1st Infantry will be pushing from the east. I need your platoon ready to go back into the breach again. Ah, the hits just keep on coming, said Brubaker, grabbing up his M16. I'll have to rearrange our roster to make up for our losses, but we'll be ready to move, Top. Okay, said Malone, but sometime today when you get a chance, I'm ordering you to stand down, get some chow and get some rest. I can't have you looking like a ragbag in front of your platoon when we board the Hueys in the morning. Well do, said Brubaker, as he stood up from his seat. Oh, and uh, get a damn shower, man, said First Sergeant. You smell like goat ass. <laughs> Roger, Top. As Brubaker turned to leave the tent, he nearly ran into a soldier that suddenly threw open the dense door flap. Oh, sorry, sir said Brubaker to the other soldier as he barged into the tent. Captain Stapleton was a tall, lanky soldier who wore wire-rimmed glasses who commanded the company. First Sergeant, you need to come with me, said Captain Stapleton. He turned to Sergeant Brubaker. Well, I'm glad you're here, Bru, smiled the officer. You need to come with me also. Donning their helmets and grabbing their rifles, Malone and Brubaker followed Captain Stapleton as he led them across the battalion's forward operating base. Stapleton was taking long strides across the dusty red clay ground that had been packed down like brick that had been baking in the oven. The morning air beat with the characteristic rhythmic thun-thun-thun-thun of Huey helicopters 
ferrying Sky Soldiers from the base out into Indian country, while other Hueys brought in supplies, ammunition, and more replacements for the meat grinder that was the Iron Triangle. Although it was only barely after eight in the morning, the heat and humidity rising from the surrounding jungle was already promising a sweaty and depressive day in South Vietnam. The trio passed the mess tent where the overworked cooks had been working since four in the morning to serve a breakfast meal of soggy French toast, powdered eggs, and fatty sausage links to the paratroopers before they went on with the business of fighting a war. Soon, they passed the 81mm mortar pits and the battery of four towed 105mm howitzers before approaching several sandbag bunkers built behind a perimeter fence of barbed wire. Beyond the barbed wire perimeter was 100 meters of relatively open flat space before the world was swallowed by a wall of thick jungle greenery. At the entrance gates, a squad of sentries were questioning a disheveled looking young American soldier who seemingly had crawled out of the bush. Sergeant Brubaker smiled and picked up his pace. It was young PFC Neely, first platoon's missing new guy. PFC Neely was given a couple of hours to clean up, change out of his fetid smelling uniform and into a clean one and grab some chow before reporting to Captain Stapleton's company command tent. Bravo Company's medics gave PFC Neely the quick once over and, aside from being tired, dehydrated and suffering from several cuts and bruises from his overnight ordeal in Indian country, Neely was relatively unharmed. Captain Stapleton was seated in a metal folding chair flanked by First Sergeant Malone and Sergeant First Class Brubaker. The battalion S2 intelligence officer, another captain named Meesway, was also there. The skinny intelligence officer with the wire-rimmed glasses and stringy moustache hovered over a fidgety and nervous PFC Neely. Okay, Private Neely, said Captain Meesway in a surprisingly deep voice. I need to know the size of the enemy you encountered. I need to know their activity and their exact ten-digit grid location. I need to know what uniform they were wearing. What exact time did you encounter them? What equipment were they carrying? Neely looked up at Captain Meesway with wide eyes, unsure about how to begin answering the intel officer's rapid-fire questions. Son, continued Meesway, sounding frustrated and not relenting or even giving young PFC Neely time to speak. Son... Your buddies are out there fighting and dying right now while you're sitting here gawking at me. We need to find those commie bastards and liberate the living hell out of them. This is your chance to score the big win. Come on, soldier. Give me that ten-digit grid coordinates. Captain Meesway, interjected Captain Stapleton. My sky soldier just survived a night alone out in Indian country. You are not going to get any data you need by interrogating him like he was one of the V.C. I wasn't exactly alone, answered PFC Neely. I know you weren't alone, answered Captain Meesway impatiently. You were surrounded by the Viet Cong. No, sir, said PFC Neely. There was another American out there. What? yelled Meesway. Captain Stapleton, are you missing another soldier? Hang on, Meesway. Captain Stapleton held up a hand to silence the intelligence officer, who was quickly getting on his nerves. Stapleton stared into PFC Neely's eyes, the young private's facial expression betraying a look that he was somehow in trouble. Neely, he began slowly but sternly, did you say there was another American there? Was he a POW? No, sir, stuttered Neely. Well, almost, well, we both almost were. But he had a couple of AK-47s, and he fought like a tiger, and he said he was zero days and wake up short, so he was headed to Da Nang. Wait a minute, Private, said Big First Sergeant Malone. Slow down. Good Lord, Neely, you're talking like a runaway M60 machine gun. Take a deep breath, Neely, said Brubaker. We want to hear what you're saying, but you need to calm down. Brubaker put two big hands on Neely's shoulders and looked at the young soldier reassuringly in the eyes. I'm glad you made it out of there, son. Now, can you tell me how you got here after the ambush? Start from the beginning and take your time. Neely gulped, then nodded. He looked down at his muddy jungle boots and then stared up again, looking with a blank expression at Brubaker. I don't know how long I was knocked out after the explosion. 
All I remember was waking up and looking over the rice paddy and seeing my squad all blown to pieces and Sergeant Halua getting shot by the VC. I, uh, I looked around to find my M16, but I think I lost it after the explosion knocked me out, so that's why I don't have any weapons, sir. That's okay, Neely, said Captain Stapleton. We'll get you a new one. Just continue telling us what happened. Yes, sir, nodded Private Neely. So I... Uh, just lay there in that muddy rice paddy, filled with water buffalo shit, and tried to dig deeper as the VC were firing over my head towards my platoon. I don't think they knew I was there, but they were so close, I could hear them yelling in Kami. Well, I couldn't hear much of anything else because of all the firing and my ears ringing, but I could just barely make out Lieutenant Dunleavy shouting for us all to pull back to the tree line. I rolled over and tried to stand up to link up with the rest of the platoon and fall back, but... I guess the explosion knocked me loopier than I realized, because I got dizzy and fell back into the shit water. I don't know how long I crawled, but I could hear the VC firing shifting away from me. I guess they were firing at my platoon. Well, anyway, I kept crawling until I got to the end of the rice paddy, dragged myself out of the shit water and loop crawled towards the jungle, hoping none of the VC would notice me and light me up. I got into the tree line unnoticed by anyone, rolled into a shallow ravine. I was covered in vines and mud and other jungle shit when I hit the bottom of the ravine. I heard a few RPGs exploding somewhere off to my right and people yelling for McPherson, the medic. I remember drifting in and out of consciousness. I could hear more of the VC just a few feet away from me on top of the ravine. I thought they'd spot me for sure, but I'd rolled under a thick thorn bush. Soon I could hear the choppers coming and Sergeant Brubaker yelling something somewhere in the distance on the other side of the ravine. I remember thinking, oh, not to forget about me, but it would have been suicide for me to have yelled anything. I heard radio static, people yelling in both commie and English. Lots of machine gun fire, and I guess I passed out again after that. Neely looked to Captain Stapleton. What happened to my squad, sir? What happened to Wilson and Peterson and Fenton? We all went to basic training together at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We all came to Vietnam together. Neely fought back the tears as first Sergeant Malone told him how his squad had died. Unknowingly, Neely's story provided the key which solved a small puzzle. Why would an experienced soldier like Sergeant Halua charge over open ground in the middle of an ambush? The answer was, he saw Private Neely get knocked down, and Halua knew that Neely wasn't dead. More than likely, the reason why Sergeant Halua had left cover was to pull PFC Neely back to the platoon's positions when a hidden enemy machine gun cut him down. Brubaker handed him a canteen of cool water, which Neely drank greedily, coughing as he gulped down the last drops. Easy, Private, said Brubaker. Do you need a second to compose yourself? Neely shook his head. No, Sarge, I'm fine. I can continue. Neely cleared his throat before picking up where he'd left off. It was dark by the time I regained consciousness, and what I thought were thorns biting into me turned out to be fire ants, and the buzzing I heard were mosquitoes making a banquet of my hands and face. I could hear movement all around me and the clacking of rifle slings hitting rifle barrels and water sloshing around in water canteens. They were close by, like just on the opposite sides of the bushes that surrounded me, and they were whispering in Vietnamese. How many were there? yelled Captain Measway. What do they look like? Did you make an attempt to capture one? Can you remember what they were saying? What direction were you heading? You aren't helping anything, sir, said First Sergeant Malone. Measway, said Captain Stapleton sternly, stop interrogating my soldier. You'll get your answers after he's done telling us what happened. Staring daggers at the intel officer, Captain Stapleton said to PFC Neely, I'm sorry, son. Please continue. Again, Neely cleared his throat. Yes, sir. Well, I waited until I couldn't hear any movement around me, and I slowly crawled out from underneath the thorn bushes. I was still somewhat dizzy, but I walked in the direction in which I heard the VC running, because I figured that's where you guys would be if you were still there. I walked for a few minutes, the moon only barely illuminating the jungle. I was blind as a bat, holding my hands out in front of me so I didn't bump into a tree or a VC or something. My head was pounding and I was still dizzy. And that's when my stomach decided it hated everything inside of it. I stumbled onto my knees in the dark and crawled forwards, 
thrown up next to what I'd hoped was a strand of trees. I was retching louder than I'd hoped, and it echoed all across the jungle, but I didn't hear anyone approaching. I was actually feeling much better after I puked, and I didn't feel dizzy anymore when I stood up. But when I stepped backwards, my boot hit a tripwire. Bright red flash shot straight up into the night air with a whoosh. It's probably one that we'd said. Now it announced to the entire universe that my dumb ass was there. Well, all of a sudden I could hear lots of footsteps racing back in my direction and Vietnamese shouting all around me. I could also hear the click-clack of bullets being chambered into AK-47s. With that much VC shouting, I knew that they owned the countryside. I was the only American left alive in that sector. I turned and ran off into the jungle, just trying to get out of the glare from the trip flare which was suspended under a parachute above me and spotlighting me in a pink light. Well, I was hoping that the VC would think I was a deer or something that set off the trip flare, but Mr. Victor was really close behind me and I was making too much noise as I ran. So I just kept running blindly through the jungle. Managed to get out from under the trip flare's light, but my night vision was ruined. I kept running into the jungle until I blindly slammed my noggin straight into a tree. I was stunned for a second, but I could hear the enemy now closing in behind me, and another group closing from my left. Before I could clear my head, something big reached from the jungle to my right and grabbed me, pulling me into the bushes. From behind me, I felt one big arm wrapped around my neck and another big hand covered my mouth as I was pulled down behind the tree which my dumb ass had just run into. Once again, I was engulfed in the shadows of a leafy bush while just a few feet away from me on the other side of the tree, I could hear at least a dozen enemy soldiers running past where I and whoever had grabbed me lay in the shadow. We hunkered down, holding our breaths until the sound of the enemy's searching feet faded into the distance. Very slowly, Whoever grabbed me released me with one arm, still keeping his other hand over my mouth. He turned my face to face his and made a shushing motion with his free hand. Well, my eyes must have been as wide as saucers because in the dim moonlight I could make out his features. The guy had a dough rag wrapped around his head instead of a helmet, and his face was camouflaged in black and green stripes. Well, he was huge, I mean, probably even bigger than you, First Sergeant, and he wore this strange uniform wasn't olive drab like ours, but had some kind of green and brown tiger stripe camouflage pattern. He looked to me and whispered, You Private First Class Neely? Please tell me your name's PFC Neely. I nodded, his big hand still covering my mouth and nose. Then the big guy smiled and for the first time, I saw that his eyes were blue. He was American. Jeez, kids, whispered the big guy. A friendly smile never leaving his face. We've been searching all over the place for you. Where's your rifle, Neely? Oh, I lost it in the rice paddy, I answered, probably sounding pretty stupid. It's probably covered in shit water and mud and wouldn't fire anyway. Yeah, yeah, probably right, kid, smiled the big guy. Them new M16s just look for an excuse to jam. I've always been an M14 guy myself. Well, the big guy rolled over grabbing something which he placed on the ground behind it. Here you go, kid, he said, handing me one of the two AK-47s he had. Oh, these things never jam. Hell, oh, I've seen these things fire just fine, caked in mud and dirt. Granted, they were firing at me, but I was still impressed. My eyes widened again. Where'd you get these two VC AK-47s? I asked as I took one of the communist weapons from him. The big guy winked, his toothy grin never fading. Well, let's just say the two VC that I took these from don't need them anymore. Right, come on, we have to move if we're going to get to your firebase. Wait, I said. You were looking for me. Where's the rest of your team? Well, we got in a firefight with Mr. Victor earlier, said the big guy. We took a casualty, so the rest of my team extracted out of the field. I decided to stay behind to search for you. Now, the big guy was just a silent shadow in front of me. He was so silent and stealthy when he got up and faded into the jungle. I would have never known he was there unless I was looking directly at him. Whatever training they gave those guys, it was awesome. Well, I'm really sorry about your friend, I said to the big guy, as he led me through the jungle like he knew where he was going in that black maze. Hey, he said. Ah, it was his time. Marines die. 
That's what we do. It's okay, though. As long as we take more of those assholes with us. Right, wait. Then he stopped suddenly. I froze two steps behind him. He turned quickly and jumped at me, knocking me down and back into the dirt just as an automatic weapon fired at us out of the darkness from the right. Good lord, he hit me like a linebacker when he knocked me down. Before I realized that the VC had set an ambush for us, the big guy was already on his feet and had tossed a frag grenade in the direction of the VC position. It exploded right where the VC had set up their machine gun, and we took off running again. So he was just like First Sergeant Malone, but, well, you know, as a Marine. Uh, ain't no Marine like me, Private, said Malone. Don't you ever use my name and the word Marines in the same sentence. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, First Sergeant, stammered Private Neely. I didn't mean to make you angry, First Sergeant. Just get on with your report, Private Neely, said Malone. Yeah, Neely, added Brubaker. What was the name of the other guy who was with you? Did he say what unit he was with? Oh, I was just getting to that, Sarge, said Neely. So we fell back away from the ambush for about a half a click before we stopped and took cover again. We were under a bunch of foliage and listening for any signs of pursuit. I heard a lot of VC yelling, and they were probably calling for their medics after the big guy fragged them. But after a while, the jungle went silent again. I felt like the VC were all around us, though. Well, uh, when we were laying there under the bushes, I whispered to the big guy. You know who I am, so who are you? What's your name? Uh, the big guy just looked at me and said... Uh, the boys just call me Warpaint. Hang on. Hang on, interjected Captain Meesway, writing furiously in a notepad. Warpaint? Is that one word or two? I'm sure it's two words, Captain Meesway, groaned Captain Stapleton. Private Neely, would you please continue? Yes, sir. Uh, anyway, I looked at the big guy and said, Warpaint, you're... The war paint. I can't believe it. You're like a legend in the Iron Triangle. Well, war paint just snickered and whispered. Are you sure you're not exaggerating? I'm not a legend. I'm just a lowly infantry grunt, just like you kids. Just trying to get my ass home in one piece. But you're a marine recon scout sniper, I said. Stars and Stripes even did a story about you. They said you have at least 63 kills. Twenty of them from this operation alone. <sighs> Lies, said Warpaint. I've got at least ninety to a hundred kills. Well, I mean, you know, Warpaint grunted. That's if I was actually counting and keeping score, which I'm not. I'm just, you know, setting the record straight is all. It's not like I'm in some competition with Gunny Hathcock to see who gets the most kills or anything. Well, I heard you got busted down from Staff Sergeant to Corporal, I said. How did that happen? A warpaint just left. Me, a bottle of tequila, a pass into Saigon, a couple of cute Simbargel Sinomines, and some asshole first cavalry gunship pilot. Didn't mix well. Apparently I put the asshole gunship pilot and a couple of equally assholeish MPs in the hospital for a couple of days. Gunny Hathcock had no choice but to bust me down a few ranks. You know Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hathcock? I said. He's my platoon leader, said Warpaint. You want to know a secret, kid? It was Gunny Hathcock who started the fight in the first place. Well, that made me laugh. I was actually calming down and relaxing for the first time since the ambush. Warpaint's easygoing confidence made me start to believe that I might actually survive until the morning. Oh, I heard the VC has a bounty on your head, Warpaint, I said. Last I heard, Uncle Ho Chi Minh is paying $10,000 for your dog tags covered with your blood. Warpaint snicked and smiled. Yeah, well, kid, that'll never happen. We lay quietly on the ground for several minutes, listening for the sounds of movement and enjoying the swarms of mosquitoes and other biting insects. Oh, I must have smelled like goat ass and patty shit, but Warpain didn't smell like anything at all. He was that cool. After a while, he silently got up and said, Okay, coast clear. We need to head northeast towards the stream, which marks the boundary between the Army and Marine Corps operations in the Triangle. Your firebase should be about a mile east of there. I don't know how he knew which way to go through the jungle in almost pitch dark, 
but he walked through those woods as if he were walking through his own house with all the lights turned off. More than once we had to stop and take cover as a VC patrol came stalking out of the bush, but eventually, as the sun began to peek up over the mountains, we could see the stream about a half mile away flowing through the shallow valley. The VC probably also knew we'd be heading towards the stream as well because a squad of them were waiting to ambush us there. Our Warpaint and I returned fire with our AK-47s until we ran out of ammo. Then Warpaint grabbed me and pushed me ahead of him and told me to run to the stream. Well, we tore through the forest with the VC hot on our tails. Well, luckily for us, the jungle got a lot denser the deeper we ran down into the valley, and we lost our pursuers, although we could hear them running and yelling in the distance. We hunkered down again under an embankment when we heard a couple of F-100 Super Sabre fighters dropping bombs just over the next ridge. The VC took off running when they heard our bombers coming, and they didn't hear any signs of pursuit. We got up and hauled ass as fast as we could for the stream. We made a way to a bend in the stream, which would conceal us from most of the VC behind us when we crossed. I stopped for a second to fill my canteen and get a drink of water while Warpaint kept lookout. The coast was clear on our side of the bend in the stream, but as luck would have it, as we waded into the water and crossed to the other side, a VC soldier taking a piss in the stream caught sight of us from the other side of the bend. He yelled something in Kong and fired us with his AK. Well, I was out in the open when the VC fired and I knew that I was had. Warpaint just swatted the round out of the sky. We took off back into the jungle. Hang on, Private Neely, said Malone. Are you saying that guy Warpaint swatted down a bullet that was fired at you? Did he bat it down with his AK-47? No, Sergeant, answered Neely. We dropped our AKs when we ran out of ammo. Warpaint just hit the bullet out of the sky. You know, like it was a fly. Mm-hmm, said the big first sergeant, looking dubiously at Captain Stapleton and Sergeant Brubaker. Obviously the VC soldier missed, said Captain Measway. Now, oh, continue your report, Neely. Oh, Private Neely looked as if he was going to argue with the assertion that the enemy soldier missed, but instead he continued. Warpaint and I crept the last mile back up to the base camp. I think we saw about a company-sized VC heavy weapons armament assembling on the side of the stream, which we'd just crossed, well, probably more. Captain Measway pulled out a map and set it down on Captain Stapleton's desk, scanning the area that Private Neely had described. Did you get the information that you needed, Captain Measway? Asked Sergeant Brubaker. Hmm, I think so, answered Captain Measway. Yeah, I called in that F-100 stride this morning, thinking that area was where the VC was assembling. Looks like I was half a click off with my calculations. Good thing we missed, or else Neely and Warpaint would have been toast. But I know exactly where that bend in the stream is located, where Neely and Warpaint cross, so... I know precisely where the VC's assembling. Misway folded up his map and made for the tent flap. I've got to get to the battalion TOC and have them call in Artie and close air on that grid coordinates. Good job, Neely. Glad you made it back safely. Thank you, sir, said Neely as Misway exited the tent. A second later, the battalion physician entered. Good morning, gentlemen, said the physician. Oh, don't mind me, I Heard that we had a little lost private that crawled out of the bush this morning who got pretty banged up. I'm just here to observe. Thanks, Doc, answered Captain Stapleton. Yeah, we're almost done here. Then Private Neely's all yours. Neely, can you finish your report? Where's Warpaint? Well, sir, started Neely. We crawled out of the jungle about a hundred meters from the main gate of the firebase when Warpaint told me to go ahead and get back to my TOC. When I asked him why I wasn't coming... He said it was because he was zero days and a wake-up short. Oh, I was supposed to fly out of Da Nang and get back to the Philippines to catch that freedom bird home to the States Guild, said Warpaints. Well, my tour of duty in Vietnam ended two days ago. Wait, what? I said. Are you crazy? You stayed an extra couple of days in Vietnam when you could be on your way home. How are you Marines that stupid? Why did you stay? Well, Warpaint gave out a big hearty laugh. Because you were lost, kid. <laughs> My platoon went out to find you, and I couldn't leave knowing one of our guys was stuck out there in the triangle all by his lonesome. No way, kid. 
That ain't how my daddy raised me. Well, Warpaint put his hand on my shoulder and told me to go ahead and head back to the base that he'd be fine getting to Danang to catch the Freedom Bird back home. I turned and said, Thank you, Warpaint. You really are a legend. You really are a hero. I could never do what you do. Well, Warpaint smiled at me and said, Are you kidding, kid? I'm no big deal. Hell, I can't do what you do, Sky Soldier. What are you talking about? I asked. Airborne, kid, said Warpaint. No way, not for this guy. Believe me, in my opinion, anyone who jumps out of a perfectly good airplane like you Sky Soldiers do is balls of steel. Now, go on, kid. Get out of here. Well, I turned around. And that was the last I saw of Warpaint. Finished Neely. Hang on, Private Neely, said the physician. Who do you say brought you out of the bush? Warpaint, sir, said Neely. The physician squinted down at Neely, as if examining him with his eyes. He then walked around the desk to where Captain Stapleton was sitting and whispered in his ear. You sure, Doc? asked Stapleton, and the physician nodded. I want to see, Doc, said Stapleton. Yep. Agreed the physician. I think we all need to take a look. Neely, everybody, follow me. The physician led them out and across the firebase to a large green tent on the right. The medical tent was quiet for now, with a few ambulatory cases laying in cots awaiting a dust-off to a hospital facility. The physician led the group to a private section at the back of the tent. Five of the six beds were empty. A rubber body bag rested on the sixth bed. This part of the tent, unfortunately, was the final stop of too many soldiers before they were taken out of the battlefield. The physician unzipped the olive green bag. We lost him last night. A dust off is coming to pick him up and our wounded to take them to Da Nang later in the morning. He pulled back the flap. I don't doubt your story, Private Neely, but this is the Marine named Warpaint, and he's been here since he passed away after his recon team was ambushed last night. Neely gulped, putting a shaking hand to his mouth. Private Neely, said First Sergeant Malone gravely, is this the Marine who helped you last night? Is this war paint? Private Neely nodded, recognizing the familiar camouflage paint even under the dry blood on the big Marine's face. Suddenly, war paint's arm rolled out from under the body bag. Clutched in his bloody right hand were his blood-soaked dog tags. Tears fell from Private Neely's face. That's why you said the VC would never collect on your bounty right, said Neely. Because you wouldn't let him take it even after you died. The physician gently lifted the dog tags from Warpaint's hand. I think uh, he'd want you to have this now, Private Neely. We're going back into the triangle tomorrow, said Sergeant Brubaker. We could use all the help we can get. Are you up for it, Neely? Absolutely, said Neely, holding Warpaint's dog tags to his chest. I'm a mother freaking sky soldier. So, um, a lot of you getting in touch and telling me you like these uh, military, special ops, sci-fi kind of stories. And, well, so do I, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I like to mix it up here on the channel, do all kinds of genres and stuff. But this really is a favorite of mine. And um, a lot of you, like I said, have been getting in touch saying, oh, can you do some more? So, um, another brilliant story there from Taxi Dancer. Could be the start of a new series. And, of course, I've got some of his other works still waiting to be done. Some three-hour epics. Uh, yep. You know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> that is coming up very soon, but you know I need to work up to it because it's a lot of work. Definitely coming up. And some more like this. So in the comment section, please let me know if you like this one. If you did, lots more on the way. Can't say better than that, can I? Well, it's Sunday. Go and rest. Have a bit of fun if you can. Because I'll be back again tomorrow night. And I want you all to join me once more. So you will. Go on. All right, then. Till the next time. Very, very sweet dream. Some bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. 
really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.